if you want to come after me, if you want to follow me, there are three ingredients to that commitment. Let's look at them. Number one, self-denial. He said to them, verse 34, if anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself. He must deny himself. The verb is a very strong verb in the Greek language. It means to disown. It means to refuse, to associate with. It actually means to refuse to be in companionship with. It means to separate, and the one you are separating from is yourself. You are disdaining any further association with the person that you are. The natural, depraved, selfish, impotent, sinful self in whom dwells no good thing. You are invited to disassociate yourself with all that you are, all that you have, all that you are related to, all that you desire, all ambition, all possessions, all people, all self-will, all plans, all agendas. It's a full self-denial to refuse to associate any longer with the person that you are. Sort of like Peter later denying Jesus and saying, I don't know the man. This is what our Lord says you have to say about yourself. I don't know that man. This is true conversion. This is the first essential of becoming a Christian. The heart sees in itself only what is undesirable. The heart sees in its desires and ambitions and plans and purposes and relationships something to be rescued from. It wants itself rescued from itself. Self is cast away. Everything submits to Christ, to His purpose, His plan, His will, His people. A person who desires to hold on to self cannot make this commitment. That's why Paul says, Philippians 1, for to me to live is Christ. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. That is to say, I died. I live, but really it's Christ living in me. It is exchanging my life for His life, my will for His will, my plans for His plans. Subjecting not only myself to the spiritual power of Christ to change me, to, to subject myself to the gift of forgiveness by grace, but it is to subject myself to the Lordship of Christ in utter rejection of self-sufficiency and self-will. Paul, the apostle in Philippians 3, this is a good illustration, is a very devout and religious Jew. He says, I, I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation Israel, a tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness in the law, blameless, very devout, very religious. But whatever things were gained to me, not the things that were bad, but all the good religious things, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. You give away not only the bad of your life, but you give away the artificial good of your life, all the supposedly noble things. And you say with Paul in Romans 7, 18, I know that no good thing dwells in my flesh. This is the hard-hitting uh, attitude of the Beatitudes, isn't it? Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's the foundation of all movement toward God. That's the foundation of all salvation, the foundation of all virtue. To say you're poor in spirit means I'm spiritually bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt. Unless we know how doomed we are, how sinful we are, how incapable we are of pleasing God, unless we know that in us dwells no good thing. Unless we realize that only, to borrow the experience of Samson, out of the carcass can come the honey, 
will never be saved. It is the sense of our deadness, the sense of our alienation, the sense of our hopelessness that drives us to this despair where we are willing to give up ourselves. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Salvation is for the spiritually crushed, the spiritually bankrupt. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, Thou wilt not despise. You know, there are so many invitations given to people that just completely ignore this, but this is the very essence of what our Lord taught. It's the attitude of the publican in Luke 18 who pounds his chest, won't even lift his eyes to look toward heaven. He feels so unworthy, so crushed under the weight of his sin and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. A parable or two that tie into this are found... Uh, in uh, Matthew 13, 44 to 46, a man finds a pearl of great price, and in order to purchase it, he sells everything he has. A man finds a treasure in a field, and in order to purchase it, he sells everything he has. That's the kind of language we have here. You give up everything for Christ. You're willing to release all relationships, all possessions, all ambitions, all desires. doesn't mean the Lord is going to strip you of everything like that. But if you're willing for Him to strip you, then you're serious about how important, how valuable, how priceless the gift of salvation and forgiveness really is. When you deny yourself, you take Christ on His terms, not yours. The proud sinner, sure, proud sinners will take Christ and their own pleasure, Christ and their own plans, Christ and their covetousness. Christ and their immorality, but the crushed and the broken and the poor in spirit are so desperate that they will give up anything and everything for what Christ provides.